everyone. I'm Jessica. I'm working with Dr. Michael Ochoa, and I'll be talking to you today about my research on the finite element method. So the system that we're interested in studying is the one that I drew up there, not so aesthetically, but we have solid silicon. And a few silicon atoms are replaced by phosphorus or boron or some other impurity in a very precisely spaced array. And instead of my ugly drawing, here is a real picture from NIST of dopant array systems that they built with quantum dots embedded in silicon. And there are a lot of applications of these dopant array systems, in particular in quantum computing, quantum materials, and quantum analog simulations but I wanna focus my attention today on quantum analog simulations. So what a quantum analog simulation aims to do is it aims to emulate the behavior of a particular Hamiltonian. And this is important because unlike a real system with a similar or perhaps the same Hamiltonian, the dopant array system is very configurable. So we can easily build its phase diagram by adjusting the parameters a lot more easily than with a real system. And one really important Hamiltonian that we want to study with the dopant array system is the Hubbard model, which is a ubiquitous Hamiltonian in condensed matter physics that describes the behavior of many body systems. And every term in the Hubbard model describes an important physical aspect of our system, but I want to focus my attention on the last term in the Hubbard model, which describes the energy that comes from interacting electrons at the same site. And it can be thought of as the Coulomb repulsion energy term. And in order to efficiently model the Hubbard model with our um, dopant array system, we want to understand how the Coulomb repulsion term changes with various important parameters of our dopant array. And one of them is the distance between the dopants. And one way that we can compute the Coulomb repulsion energy is by starting off with the Poisson equation from ENM, which relates the electric potential to the charge density in a given region. And if we know the wave function of, our, of, of the electrons, then we can use that as the charge density in the Poisson equation. And once we solve the Poisson equation for the electric potential, we can then calculate the average value of the electric potential energy, which gives, a, gives us the Coulomb repulsion term. And this method is very fast in computing the Coulomb repulsion energy compared to other similar methods because we only have to compute a three-dimensional integral. And also we have a very fast method to solve the Poisson equation. And that method is called the finite element method. So the finite element method applies to any partial differential equation. It's a numerical algorithm. And like any other numerical algorithm, it takes the continuous problem and turns it into a discrete one. And in each of the cells in this discrete grid, we want to define a set of basis functions that add to one that allow us to approximate the solution to our PDE as a weighted sum of those basis functions. And then we rewrite our uh, PDE into its weak formulation with some algebra and integration by parts. And the point of that is basically to turn it into a set of linear equations. And so from a bird's eye view, the finite element method takes a partial differential equation and turns it into a set of linear equations. And we have a ton of optimized algorithms to solve linear equations. So the finite element method is very, very fast. And another advantage of the finite element method is that it can solve a PDE on a variety of domains. It's very flexible, which is important for our dopant array system because it can be configured into a lot of different shapes. But one challenge that we're facing with the finite element method is can be illustrated by this plot here that we use to calculate um, the charging energies of this phosphorus trimer system embedded in silicon, which we calculated with the finite element method. And when we compare our results to experimental values, we see that we're almost twice underneath what the value is supposed to be. And so my project this summer is essentially to try to understand the finite element method and what's causing it to underestimate these charging energies. And I did this by applying the finite element method to a test system. And that test system is the hydrogen molecular ion, which as pictured here is a system of two protons and one electron. And this is a Schrodinger equation, which can be solved by a change of variables and a numerical algorithm called the shooting method. And here are some pictures of its ground state as calculated in Mathematica. 
And here are some pictures of its excited state. And what we want to do is we want to use these wave functions in the Poisson equation and solve for the electric potential to calculate the Coulomb repulsion energy as a function of the separation between the pro protons. And here was that result. And there are a couple of um, important properties of this graph that basically reassure us that the finite element method is doing its job. One of them is that we see that the Coulomb repulsion energy correctly decreases when we separate the protons, which is an intuitive result. And secondly, we see that the finite element method could capture that the excited state has a lower overall repulsion energy than the ground state, which makes sense because in the excited state, the wave function is a lot more spread out than in the ground state. And finally, we can see that our results are on the scale of what's measured in experiment for the hydrogen molecule electron to electron repulsion. And although it doesn't precisely fit the trend, we're not actually calculating the hydrogen molecule repulsion energy, but it's on the same scale, which gives us reassurance. So all three of these signs are very good in, for the finite element method, and they tell us that it's a reliable method to calculate the Coulomb repulsion energy. But with any numerical algorithm, it's important to not just look at the final results, but also ask about the process how stable were the results in terms of various numerical parameters? And one of these numerical parameters is the domain that we solve our partial differential equation on. Notice that when we solve the Poisson equation from negative 60 to 60 and negative 20 to 20 in X and Y, we get very different results for the electric potential. And the reason for that can be best explained by this plot of the Coulomb repulsion energy calculated as a function of the maximum X and Y values of our domain. When we're too close to the origin, we don't capture the full behavior of the electric potential because the boundary conditions don't actually describe the electric potential well when we're too close to the origin. And so we end up underestimating the Coulomb repulsion energy by a lot. And similarly, when we go out too far, then we have a lot of instabilities in our PDE solver. And so we also end up underestimating the Coulomb repulsion energy. And notice that there were a lot of ways that we could underestimate this Coulomb repulsion energy. And we think that's a contributing reason for why we underestimated the charging energies in our phosphorus trimer. And another important question to ask about any numerical algorithm is to test its limits. When does the finite element method break down? And with, we saw this firsthand with our one-dimensional finite element method solver, where it was able to solve the Poisson equation with a Gaussian electron density. But with the hydrogen 1s orbital electron density, it broke down. And in particular, it severely underestimated the electric potential when the electric analytical solution had discontinuity at the origin. And we think that this is a possible reason for why um, we are underestimating those charging energies in the phosphorus trimer. And a possible fix to this would be to move on from our linear basis elements to quadratic basis elements, which can capture curvature in our solution a lot better. And another future direction would be to move on to an adaptive grid to better improve the efficiency and accuracy of our calculation. And I'd just like to thank my mentor in particular for helping me with this project.